Okay, great. So welcome everyone to the Foundations of Data Science virtual series. We are extremely happy to have Team Ravgarden with us today. Team uh, is a professor of computer science at Columbia University. And before joining Columbia, he spent 15 years at Stanford uh, in the computer science department. The team is well known for many of his work in algorithm design, like beyond worst case analysis and for laying the foundations of game theory, algorithmic game theory. He won the Godel Prize for that in 2012 for a series of work in that area. He has won many other awards as well, like starting from ACM Grace Mure Hopper Award, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, Kalai Prize in Computer Science and Game Theory, uh, the Social Choice and Welfare Prize, the Mathematical Programming Society's Tucker Prize, and the Godel Award, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, he was invited, he was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematics, the Shapley Lecture at the 2008 World Congress of the Game Theory Society, and he's also a Guggenheim Fellow, so that list is like a very long, very long list of awards and accomplishments. We are extremely happy to have Tim with us, and he's going to talk about data-driven algorithm, algorithm design today. So welcome, Tim. Uh, thanks so much, Parna, both for the kind introduction and the invitation to come speak. Happy to be here. Um, and also thanks to everyone who, who joined in the audience who uh, who uh, won the fight against Zoom fatigue and, and uh, chose to spend this hour together. Uh, thanks a lot. I wanted to tell you a little bit about work I, I did with a former PhD student, Rishi Gupta, uh, which is something now called data-driven algorithm design. Uh, it's a few years old, but um, it seemed like a good fit for the themes of the seminar, so I, I decided to go, to go with this topic. Um, before, before I tell you about it, uh, I hope you'll forgive me for a quick sort of promo, because um, there's a very relevant book that just came out literally just a couple months ago on Cambridge University Press. Um, and it's about, uh, it's about a circle of ideas known as beyond worst case analysis. So really looking for novel analysis frameworks to give you more meaningful algorithmic guarantees for various problems where sort of uh, off the shelf worst case analysis uh, isn't particularly helpful. So it's a sprawling topic. I mean, I'll be telling you about one little one little piece of it, but um, in general, there's over 30 chapters in the book, sort of over 700 pages, um, over 40, or sorry, uh, 40 authors, you know, which you see here on the list here. Um, so, you know, if you have an interest in this or if this talk piques your interest, I encourage you to, to check it out. Um, in particular, uh, I mentioned there are 30 chapters. Chapter 29 is, is actually exactly about the topic I'll discuss. And chapter 29 was written by uh, Nina Balkin, and I think that's one of the best sources for, for learning more generally about the stuff I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about today. All right, so moving on to this talk. Um, so I'm an algorithms person, as I assume are you know, several people in the audience. Um, so I literally think about algorithms, you know, like almost every day. And, you know, when you get a reputation for being an algorithm person, something starts happening, which is you start getting knocks on your door from students, colleagues, etc. Um, you know, and they come in, they'll like sit down in the chair across from my desk, you know, and they'll say, you know, hey, Tim, you're an algorithms person. Uh, I've got an algorithms problem, right? I was trying to build the system or I was trying to design the software and this sort of problem X came up in my work, right? And X, X could be any number of things, you know, for concreteness, let's say it's the, it's the traveling salesman problem. And so the, you know, my colleague will say, so, you know, I want to solve TSB or, or at least approximately, like how, what should I do? What algorithm should I use? And right, if you take a step back, you're like, this is kind of exactly the question you would want to ask an algorithms person and get a helpful answer to. But you know, those of us that do algorithms for a living know this is actually like kind of a super tricky question. Um, it's a little like you just met a medical doctor at a cocktail party and you said, hey doc, you know, I've got a stomach ache. You know, what should I do? And the reason these are sort of both tricky questions and sort of tricky in the same way is because the, the correct answer um, depends on additional details which have not been divulged, right? So there's multiple reasons why you might have a stomach ache and each of those ailments would benefit best from its own specialized medical treatment. Similarly, different applications in which the traveling salesman problem arises will generate different families of instances each family of instances perhaps best deserving of its own algorithmic treatment. So just like the medical doctor might say to me, you know, take a couple Pepto-Bismol, call me in the morning if, you, if, you, if you're not happy with the results. I might tell my colleague, you know, try local search and call me in the morning if, if you're not happy with the results. 
So the point of the story is just, you know, that unfortunately for most problems, especially when you start talking about like NP-hard problems, you know, there's no silver bullet algorithm. There's no one algorithm that's always the right one to use. The right answer is really going to depend on the details of the application, in particular, the instances of interest. So you could imagine continuing the story, you know, and doing a little bit more work, right? So like the medical doctor, you know, rather than being lazy, maybe would say, you know what, go get some blood work. Okay, and let's see the results, and then I'll be able to give you good advice about how you should treat your, your stomach ache. And in my experience, you know, doctors, when you tell them your ailments, they have a pretty good sense about how much blood work uh, you should get done. So here, you know, maybe to my colleague, instead of just blithely recommending local search, I would say, you know what, show me some representative instances of the traveling salesman problem, okay, that, that really are sort of, uh, you know, accurately depict what's going on in your application then I can have a look at those representative instances and give you sort of more, um, you know, customized advice about how you should solve the problem. You know, maybe my colleague says, oh, okay, that's a reasonable sort of request. Like how many representative instances do you need? Because they're kind of a pain to generate, to come up with. And that question is actually literally exactly what this talk is about. It's literally about quantifying the number of representative benchmark instances of a computational problem you need before you can make accurate conclusions about what is the right algorithm to use. Okay, so that's exactly what this talk is about. So let me, let me, you know, I'll get to the formalism, you know, I don't know, maybe halfway through the talk or so, but I wanted to spend some time just talking about, you know, making this more concrete, showing you that this really is how the world of algorithms works in large part, uh, sort of when, for people who are working on applications. And this will also just sort of show you kind of the, examples that were rattling around in Rishi and my brain when we came up with our with our formalism. So example number one concerns the graph coloring problem. So that's a famous MP hard problem, right? I give you an unwritten graph, some target number of colors. You want to color the vertices so that uh, every edge is, is panchromatic. Um, so it has different colors on its two endpoints. It's a well-known MP hard problem. So you need to tackle it with heuristics, you know, unless the instances are quite small. And so the plot I'm showing you on this slide is drawn from a paper of Smith Miles et al. But as you can imagine, there are similar plots on lots of other problems in the experimental um, algorithmics literature on MP hard problems. So what did they do? They did something quite natural. So they, they scoured the literature and they identified sort of the seven most promising graph coloring heuristics that were out there, okay? Then they gathered together a whole bunch of different benchmark instances that people had looked at previously in the literature. Then they ran each of those seven graph coloring heuristics on each of the benchmark instances, and they saw how well each of them did. And so each color on this plot corresponds to one of the seven algorithms. Uh, each dots on the plot corresponds to a graph coloring instance, and the color of the dot corresponds to the algorithm that did best on that particular instance. And the main thing I want you to take away from this plot is just notice that all of the colors are represented. So each of the seven algorithms seemed to have its own kind of region of superiority where it appeared to be the best algorithm to use. And so sort of the implicit advice in a plot like this and in the Smith Miles et al paper, is they're basically saying, you know, if you need to solve graph coloring, you know, figure out, you know, where it lands on this particular plot, look at the color of that region and then use the corresponding heuristic. That's the one that's likely to do best in your application. So again, just to prove this point that, you know, the right algorithm really depends on the instances that you care about. For the second example, let's move on to satisfiability, right? So the canonical constraint satisfaction problem, Boolean variables, a bunch of constraints. The question is whether there's a truth assignment to those Boolean variables that satisfies every single one of the logical constraints. So you may or may not know that uh, at least every other year, sometimes every other year, sat nerds from around the world gather together in the same place uh, and have a SAT competition, Olympic style SAT competitions. So everybody brings their latest and greatest SAT solvers. Everybody brings their sort of latest sort of uh, nefariously hard instances uh, and they run competitions and they give out gold, silver and bronze medals and, and all that. And so people have been doing this for, for over 20 years, these SAT competitions. And um, almost 15 years ago, uh, a team from UBC, University of British Columbia, they said, you know, it would be pretty fun to enter one of these SAC competitions, see if we could win some, some medals. Uh, the problem is at the time they had that conversation, the submission deadline for solvers was two weeks away. And uh, it was not realistic to devise from scratch some very innovative SAT solver in, in two weeks. 
So they had a fairly cheeky idea. They said, well, you know, let's submit something anyways. But rather than design some new stat solver from scratch, you know, let's sort of submit basically a meta algorithm, almost like an algorithm portfolio manager, which just makes educated use of existing SAT solvers. Okay? So that was their idea. A little more detail, here's how it works. So they looked at, you know, the previous SAT competitions. They looked for solvers that did really well, like two years ago, uh, and were open source. And so they settled on seven of them, seven of them, seven of them, seven SAT solvers. And they observed something sort of, you know, similar to the graph coloring plot. They observed tremendous heterogeneity in the solver's performance. Yeah, I really mean that in, in two senses. So probably the less surprising sense is that if you hold the solver fixed and you vary the instance, you get many, many orders of magnitude difference in running time across instances. Some are much easier than others. Maybe not surprising. More surprising perhaps is that even holding the instance fixed, varying over the seven SAT solvers, you would also see many orders of magnitude difference in running times very frequently. So again, each of the SAT solvers seem to have its own kind of domain of superiority. And the UBC team's goal was to just sort of smartly figure out um, which, you know, which sort of, uh, which region you were in and run the according uh, SAT solver. So they approached it in, you know, a fairly natural sort of statistical regression type way. So first they made up sort of features of SAT instances so I think it was something like 100 or 200 features, ballpark. So they attach a feature vector to each possible SAT instance, each SAT formula. Some of those features are obvious, like the number of variables and constraints, the ratio um, of clauses to variables. Some were less obvious, like Knuth's unbiased estimator of the, of the search tree, uh, or even they did things like they would run local search for a second as a pre-processing step, see how much progress local search made, and use that as one of the, one of the components in the feature vector. But in any case, whatever. So they attached every SAT instance, this feature vector of one or 200 features. And then they just solved seven regression problems, one regression problem for each of the seven SAT solvers, where the goal of that problem is to learn a function for predicting the running time of that solver as a function of the feature vector of the instance. Okay? So they did that separately for each of the seven SAT solvers, so seven different models, each one predicting the running time of one solver given the feature vector. Now, what was the algorithm they actually submitted to the competition? Well, it's exactly what you'd expect. So really, they get a new SAT instance. They spend a little bit of time computing the feature vector. They evaluate this. They now evaluate their seven prediction functions to get a predicted running time for each of the seven SAT solvers. Guess which one they ran? The one with the smallest predicted running time. Okay. So that was their meta algorithm. And they cleaned up lots of gold and lots of silver medals. They repeated the trick in 2009, sort of with a, with a sort of better version of their algorithm portfolio manager, uh, again, won tons of medals. And now these days, uh, many of the tracks of the SAT competition, these portfolio-based algorithms are explicitly disallowed from competition. They're viewed as sort of, uh, un, you know, it's, it's viewed as an unfair solution, okay? So that's again, an example of different algorithms doing well in different instances and, and how you can take advantage of it. So example three, uh, I want to talk a little bit about parameter tuning. Uh, so this is this is sort of you know this is a problem as old as algorithms itself, but certainly we hear about it a lot last ten years, given sort of the rise of, of machine learning, where it's sometimes called instead hyperparameter optimization. And um, you know we talk about gradient descent as if it is an algorithm, a single algorithm. But you think about it, that's not really true. Gradient descent, as you read it in the textbook, it's a little underspecified. That you don't actually have a concrete computational procedure you can run until you instantiate a few parameters, right? Maybe most interestingly, the, the step size. So gradient descent, as we usually speak about it, is really kind of a parameterized family of algorithms, you know, with a different algorithm for each instantiation of the relevant parameters. Or if you prefer, you know, if you're if you're running ridge regression, again, uh, you have to pick the coefficient of the L2 regularization parameter. So it's really kind of a family of algorithms indexed by your choice of that coefficient. Okay? So that's what I mean by parameter tuning and this idea that an algorithm is often sort of a parameterized family of algorithms. And just to remind you, it's not like this problem wasn't a major problem pre sort of deep learning. Um, we think about linear and integer programming uh, solvers, for example. So take like CPLEX, which is one of the <coughs> most popular commercial LP and IP solvers. 
you know, we talk about the simplex method as if it is a single algorithm, but again, there's a million different ways you can implement the details. And CPLEX actually, this may, may be more now, but at least as of a few years ago, they would export literally 135 different parameters that you could customize to sort of tweak exactly how it would run, how it would solve the linear integer programs that you give it. So that's a lot of parameters, 135 parameters. It takes 221 pages of a reference manual to even describe them all, you know, what is their function. Uh, you might hope that in 221 pages and with all the experience of the designers, you might get some sage advice about exactly how you should approach this parameter tuning problem, but you would be disappointed. All it tells you is that some experimentation may be needed. <laughs> so thanks CPLEX, big help, all right? So you're just on your own for searching this 135 dimensional problem, figuring out how to get CPLEX to work, okay? Last example I'll mention very briefly, it's really sort of a precursor to data-driven algorithm design. It's a research direction known as self-improving algorithms. Uh, there's also a chapter on this topic in the Beyond Worst Case book, I believe it's chapter 12, written by C. Shadri. And the setup's sort of similar. There's an unknown input distribution and you get a bunch of samples from it and then kind of want to figure out what you should do. But uh, the metrics used are pretty different. So the focus in self-improving algorithms has really been on having small space data structures uh, and yet still having sort of, you know, very low running times. Whereas this talk will really be about statistical questions, really like straight up sample complexity questions. So you can reinterpret some of the self-improving algorithms results in the context of our framework. But again, the goals, the goals are, are, are rather different. All right, so this is a good place to pause to see if any questions have rolled in. Or if anyone wants to ask, this is this is a good time. All right. I don't think I should keep going. Great. So these are the kinds of things, right? So Rishi and I. We were kind of just looking at the world around us and you know we just saw this stuff happening right and um it really didn't map very cleanly onto kind of uh you know um sort of the dominant paradigms of research i'd say in the theory of algorithms right so we kind of asked ourselves you know but we're theoreticians so we, we looked at we looked at these sort of motivating applications and we said you know what would be sort of a theory that would most faithfully uh kind of speak to these applications and how you know, the people who care about these applications are thinking about um, using algorithms. And you know, so I'm gonna tell you in this talk kind of what we came up with, right? And the sort of initial observation you make kind of immediately is that whatever this looks like, it's not going to be worst case analysis. Because the worst case analysis, right, it's strength is sort of also it's Achilles heel in that it makes, there's no model of data, you make no assumptions about the data. Or you know, maybe if worst case analysis has a data model, it's what I like to call the Murphy's Law data model. So Murphy's Law is the maxim that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And when you're doing worst case analysis, from the perspective of the mathematics you're doing, you're literally assuming that the only input that matters in the world is an adversarially chosen function of the algorithm you choose to use for the problem. And if you're talking about a security or cryptographic application, that may make sense. But for kind of anything else, it's a sort of strangely paranoid and, and incoherent way to think about, you know, how to how to go about tackling a, tackling a computational problem. So we need some sort of data model. That's the point. So it's not going to be worst case analysis. The good news is we is we can actually go to just another very familiar part of sort of theoretical computer science and sort of related topics, uh, namely learning theory. So I'm going I'm to try to convince you that learning theory is a very natural way to cast this problem of you know in an application specific way figuring out what's the best algorithm to use, <laughs> right? So I'll develop this in detail, but um, you know, what's, what's the high level idea? How should you, you know, what's the mapping you should be thinking about? So right in learning theory, kind of a very key notion is that of the hypothesis class, or if you want call it a concept class or a model class, whatever. Okay, so these hypotheses that you're willing to consider, that's what you're trying to sort of learn the best thing from. We, we don't care about, we don't have hypotheses, we have algorithms, right? We wanna learn the best algorithm for a problem. So I guess it must be that algorithms will somehow be playing the role of concepts and hypotheses in traditional learning theory, okay? Also in learning theory, you always have to talk about a loss function it's to assess how accurate a hypothesis is for some um, data distribution. So for us, how do we want to assess one of our functions, one of our algorithms? Well, we're gonna have some notion of algorithm performance. Maybe it's the running time or the solution quality, whatever. 
Okay, but our notion of algorithm performance will be the analog of the loss function in traditional learning theory applications. What I'm going to show you is that sort of two of the most well-studied learning theory models, so sort of the standard PAC kind of offline batch learning model, and then also the online learning model for regret minimization, et cetera, um, both of those just sort of um, very naturally model these sort of, you know, these application-specific sort of algorithm design questions. I'll spend most of my time talking about the offline case, but I will say a little bit about the online case toward the end of the talk. All right. So let's start developing the formalism. Okay. Again, we're trying to sort of make precise this idea of you want to make someone a good recommendation of an algorithm as a function of sort of the application that they care about. That's what we're trying to capture. So we will assume up front, you know, well before we came on the scene, you know, somebody decided what computational problem they wanted to solve, some problem pi. Maybe it's the TSP, maybe it's satisfiability, whatever. We will also assume that before we show up on the scene, someone has decided on the family of algorithms that they're willing to use. Okay, so we will fix a class capital C of admissible algorithms. In examples one and two, this would just be a finite set of seven things. Seven graph coloring heuristics in example number one, uh, seven SAT solvers in example number two. Okay, but once you're talking about parameterized family of algorithms, it's also very natural to have capital C be an infinite set of algorithms. And I should emphasize, like at this point, this is already like a pretty major departure from the way most sort of theoretical research on the design and analysis of algorithms works, right? So generally, you would not commit to anything in advance about your algorithms, right? Maybe you'd commit to polynomial time, or in a streaming setting, you'd commit to polylogarithmic space, something. But some very coarse computation sort of resource constraints. Subject to those coarse resource constraints, basically the game is to come up with an arbitrarily crazy algorithm as long as sort of you do better on some metric than sort of the state of the art, okay? And obviously it's been hugely successful. Um, that is not what we're doing here. So here we're really sort of thinking about someone where, you know, implementing some bespoke algorithm for their problem would be an absolute last resort, right? It's someone who has a license to CPLEX, right? They're gonna use CPLEX. The question is just how to use it in the best possible way. Or, you know, you're doing neural network training, you know you're going to use gradient descent, right? You're not going to come up with some, you know, crazy new sort of, you know, local search algorithm just for your own kind of application. You're going to use gradient descent, but you kind of want to know how to set all the parameters. Okay? And if you think about it, so this is sort of an unusual way of thinking for a theoretician, for most theoreticians, I think, but it does map on quite accurately to how a lot of the use of algorithms work in the real world. All right, so we've committed to this class of algorithms. We've committed to this problem pi. We also are going to assume up front that the decision maker has settled on their notion of algorithm performance. Uh, I would, you know, for the talk, just think about like running time being as a canonical example, and then maybe also solution quality as being another one. But it could be what are, the theory is very agnostic to what this function is. It could be correctness probability, approximation ratio, it really doesn't matter. The one thing, the one thing I'll assume is that the, the cost function is bounded. And if it's bounded, then you know I can scale it so that it lies between zero and one. Okay, so that's the one assumption I will make about the performance metric. All right, now I said algorithms are going to play the role of hypotheses, right? Hypotheses in learning theory they're they're functions, right? So like like in learning theory you might study half spaces, right? Which take Euclidean space, slice it in half, points on one side are labeled positive, the other side are negative. Or, you know, maybe you think about a fixed neural network architecture and you think about all of the weights and biases, and that would be your hypothesis class. But they're obviously functions, right? So, so, so I guess we need to somehow think about an algorithm as a function to get this correspondence with learning theory to work out right. And so there's, there's actually a very natural way to do that, which is we're going to associate each algorithm with a function that basically encodes its performance profile. So for a fixed algorithm A, like a fixed SAT solver, we think of it as a map, a real valued function from every possible input, every possible SAT formula to the real number, which is the running time or the performance of that algorithm on that input. So of that particular solver on that particular formula, okay? So in other words, like the performance profile of an algorithm, it's kind of a complicated thing, right? It's really like a vector indexed by all possible instances in the universe, all right? So that's how we think of an algorithm as a function, mapping inputs to performance of that algorithm on those inputs. Okay. 
So that's an important correspondence for us. Uh, Tim, a uh, quick question. Like, uh, do you assume like this cost function is efficiently computable? So in this question, I will focus only on statistical questions. So it will not be relevant for the kinds of results I'm asking, which is literally just like how much data do you need before you can in principle make a good recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's information theoretic. Uh, the computation of, you know, computational efficient learning is super interesting. I'll come back to that on the last slide. The one thing I'll say is I think the barriers to having computationally efficient learning algorithms along these lines, there are, uh, there are barriers sort of before you even get to worrying about, I think the cost function is the least of your problems, I guess is, a, is what I want to say when it comes to computational efficiency. Um, but I'd say for this talk in your mind, think of it, yeah. Think of it as just like you would literally just run A on Z and count the amount of time that it took. Or you would run a TSP heuristic on an instance and you just look at the cost of the tour that it outputs. I think of that as the cost function. But again, for the statistical questions, it kind of doesn't come up. So good question though, yeah. Other questions? All right, great. So we commit to a problem, we commit to a class of algorithms, we commit to a notion of algorithm performance, we can think of each algorithm as a function mapping inputs to the performance of that algorithm on that input. Probably all a little abstract. <clears throat> So let me give you a, a very concrete example, okay? And this is, a, this is a family of algorithms. I encourage you to just keep in your mind as we go through the results. The results are much more general, but personally, I always have a lot easier time interpreting theorems in real time if I have a concrete example to instantiate it with. So here's my recommendation of how to, how to instantiate it. So let's talk about the weighted independent set problem, okay? Another famous NPR problem on graphs. So the input is an undirected graph. Each vertex has a weight, non-negative weight. So in this picture, the vertices are all labeled with their weights. So what's an independent set? An independent set is a subset of mutually non-adjacent vertices. Okay, so you're not allowed to pick both endpoints of any edge. And the max weight independent set problem, no prizes for guessing what it is. So let's come up with the independent set, non-adjacent vertices, um, and maximizes the sum of the vertex weights in the set. Okay? That's an empty hard problem, even empty hard to approximate any interesting factor. So really, you know, to tackle it on non-trivial sized graphs in practice, you kind of have to resort to heuristics, okay? And actually greedy heuristics are a very natural fit for the independent set problem. So greedy heuristics where you just do a single pass over the vertices, and every time you get to a new vertex, you make an irrevocable decision about whether to include it in your independent set or not, okay? Uh, if you've already picked some neighbor of a vertex in the past, then you're blocked from picking this one. But uh, if you're not blocked from picking the current vertex, then go ahead and pick it. Put it, augment your independent set with this new, new vertex. Okay, so there's, this is still underspecified because there's a question of how do you order the vertices before you do a single pass over them. And so the first thing you might think about is like, well, we want to maximize weight, so why not just sort of you know start with the highest weight vertex and go from there? Okay, so sort of decreasing order of weight, and that's a totally reasonable thing to experiment with in an actual application. Uh, in this instance, for example, you know you'd start with the weight four vertex, you would pick it. That blocks all of its neighbors, so all of the weight three vertices. So the only thing that's left that's eligible is the weight two vertex. So you get an independent set of weight six here. Uh, that's not optimal, as we'll see. Um, the second greedy heuristic you might think about, um, and has been you know, studied a lot, is kind of order of vertices by bang per buck. Okay? So what I mean by that, well, you're not gonna look at the weights, you're gonna look at the weights normalized by one plus the degrees. Why would you do this? Well, this is a cost benefit analysis. Right? So if you include a vertex V in your independent set, the benefit is you get its weight. You get a weight of W sub V. The cost is it knocks out from further consideration, not only V, but also all of its degree of V neighbors. Okay. So this is, these are vertices where you get a high bang per buck. So in this particular instance, um, you know, the first vertex we consider would not be the four because the degree of the of, uh, weight four vertex is so high, you take this weight three vertex that has a single edge. Um, there's actually a tie for what the algorithm might do next, but one of the things it could do is next pick the other degree one vertex for weight two. And now you notice that the lower right weight three vertex is still not blocked. So later on the algorithm will include that as well. And so that'll get a weight uh, independence set with total weight eight, which is better than what we had before. And indeed this is optimal for this instance. But don't let me trick you. It would be, it would be very easy to come up with an equally simple example where greedy algorithm number one came up with the optimal weighted independent set and greedy algorithm number two did not, okay? 
So again, like kind of almost any pair of non-trivial algorithms, sometimes one of them does better, sometimes the other one does better. We like to reason about you know which one does better for some distribution of representative instances. Okay. So those are two heuristics, <laughs> but now already we see kind of how trivial it is to generate natural infinite families of algorithms, which is like just literally interpolate between these two heuristics I just showed you. There's different ways of doing that, but let's look at the way where you parameterize by an exponent in the denominator. So sort vertices by weight divided by one plus degree raised to the power P. Okay, P here, think of it as between zero and one. You said P equals zero, you get greedy algorithm number one. You said P equal one, you get greedy algorithm number two. You said P equal a half, you get a different greedy algorithm, which will have its own sort of you know, relative merits. Okay? When you're doing theoretical analysis, there's usually not a reason to pick P equal one half, but you know, on an actual family of instances, P equal one half may well be better than P equal zero or one, totally possible. Okay? And notice we now have literally a separate algorithm for every choice of P. Okay? So an uncountable family of algorithms of course, all of the algorithms are very simple and they're very tightly related to each other, but you have to concede it is, you know, an uncountable set of algorithms, just parameterizing by this exponent. Okay. So that's a good class to keep in mind. Okay, so capital C is infinite, but intuitively it's like quite simple in structure. Okay. And so the question is, what can you say about, you know, how many representative instances you need when this is the kind of algorithm that you're searching for the best, the best candidate from? Okay. So here then really is the model. And it really is sort of straight up pack, you know, batch, batch learning. Okay, so for those of you that know this, uh, it's really exactly the same thing. So we have our problem P, we have our uh, class of algorithms capital C, we have our performance measure cost. Now, another part, another thing we'll assume um, is an unknown distribution capital F over the inputs of the problem. Okay, so unlike pi C and the performance measure, all of which we know up front, the unknown, uh, the input distribution capital F, we do not know. So this is the probability distribution of a SAC formula or the TSP instances or whatever. And so right, this, for the last half hour, I've been kind of emphasizing this application specific decision-making. This is the application specific part. Okay? That is all wrapped up into just this one choice of the input distribution capital F, right? So that's an assumption. That's an assumption of our model. Whatever is interesting about your application shows up through the choice of the input distribution capital F, which again is not known a priori to anybody, but it's there, okay? So representative instances correspond to draws from the input distribution capital F. Capital F represents the application, okay? So application is this input distribution, benchmark instances corresponds to samples from the distribution. And so we're gonna have to make a decision not knowing capital F except in as much as we know one or more representative instances, one or more samples in capital F. What is little s? How many samples? That's exactly the question we want to answer. How big does s need to be? How much work does my colleague need to do generating different representative TSP instances before I'm confident I can make them a good decision about which TSP heuristic is the right one for them? How big does little s need to be before we make a good decision? What does making a good decision mean? It basically means you, you recommend to them the basically optimal algorithm okay, from the ones they're willing to use. So optimal from capital C. What do I mean by optimal? I mean the one with the best expected performance where the expectation is with respect to the underlying unknown input distribution. Okay? So notice that for different input distributions, capital F, you're taking different expectations here. So there will be a different optimal algorithm, A star, for different input distribution, capital F which is exactly what we want, okay? We're just trying to, so we're saying like, whatever capital F is, you need to figure out what is the corresponding A star and do it from as little data as possible, okay? And okay, we don't have to get exactly the optimal um, algorithm from capital C, but we'd like to be within say plus minus F, plus, you know, we'd like to be within epsilon of the best, okay? So any questions at this point? All right, so this is the formal model for the offline case. This is our um, this is our criterion for success. You know, identifying the algorithm which is you know essentially the best expected performance, and the free parameter is little s. So the question is so intuitively if you take s to be infinity, at that point you basically know capital F, and so you know the corresponding a star. But like, what if s is ten? What if I give you ten TSP instances? How much confidence can you have that you're recommending a good heuristic? Okay, that's what we want to know. All right, so what can we hope to prove? 
Well, uh, we might hope for an analog of sort of the coolest results you get when you study learning theory. Um, and so what learning theory has done unbelievably well is it's, it's, it's made quantitative the intuition you know, that simple things should not be very difficult to learn, meaning you don't, shouldn't need much data to learn something simple. But if you're trying to learn something really complicated, you may need a lot of data before you figure it out. Okay. Now, for that, for, the, for that to turn into theorems, you need to commit to what it means for you know functions to be simple, or hypotheses to be simple, or to be complex. Okay. But that's like exactly what learning theory has figured out. And happily, we will not need to come up with our own custom, customized notion of complexity. Okay. We will be able to stand on the shoulders of statistical uh, learning theory and use one of the standard notions there. Okay. It's a it's a notion which is called the pseudo dimension. Okay. Now, um, so the pseudo dimension is going to play a, a sort of important role in our results. Uh, the way I have the talk right now, I'm actually not going to show you the literally exact definition of pseudo dimension. I do have a slide on it. If anyone's really offended, you know, and feels like it's not a complete talk unless I show you that slide, I'm happy to do that. But at least my plan A is to just tell you kind of the salient characteristics of pseudo dimension so that you kind of know why we're using it and what are the applications and so that you know why we can bound it for the function classes that we care about, okay? All right, so a couple of things. So first of all, like why this definition, right? So like hopefully we're all clear on what we want. We want to know sample complexity of figuring out the best algorithm, or almost best algorithm, right? So why is pseudo dimension relevant to that problem? Well, it's actually not just relevant to that problem. It literally is basically the exact same problem. Okay, so literally, whatever the sample complexity is, so like the, the by sample complexity, I mean the smallest S, smallest number of samples, so that you can achieve the goal on the last slide, that sample, computing that sample complexity literally reduces to computing this pseudo dimension of the course of the class of algorithms. Okay? Strictly speaking, pseudo dimension refers to a family of functions, we have a family of algorithms, but remember an algorithm is really a function via its performance profile. It's a mapping from inputs to algorithm performance, okay? So in other words, our, the question I hope I've convinced you we really care about literally reduces to the problem of computing this, of computing this definition, computing this pseudo dimension, all right? I'll, I'll give you a precise statement on the next slide of that, point, okay? but that's why we care. Now, let me hand wave about the definition a little bit. Okay, so that you just are more comfortable with it and so that you know enough to follow kind of a short proof that I'll do in a few slides. Okay. And I want to speak separately to two audiences. Okay. First of all, some of you, uh, I'm sure, have some familiarity with VC dimension. Okay. And for those, for you, the main thing I want to say is if you feel like you understand VC dimension, you literally understand pseudo dimension. It's literally the same thing. The only difference is that VC dimension as it's defined, is only for zero one value functions. It's a binary value function, a true false. <clears throat> Pseudo dimension is the exact analog for functions that are real valued rather than zero one value. Okay. And if you think and, and if you think about it, actually like you can, you know, how do you how do you convert real valued functions into zero one functions? You just pick a threshold, right? And above a hundred, you know, that's one value, below a hundred, that's a different value. And pseudo dimension is literally just the VC dimension of the threshold of your functions thresholded in the worst possible place. Okay, so that's literally it. Okay, so if you know if you know VC dimension, shattering, etc., you know pseudo dimension exactly the same. Okay, all right. So let me say a little bit about those of you that either do not know or do not remember very well VC dimension. So what does VC dimension and pseudo dimension measure? Um, so basically, it it, it says a family of functions, we're going to call it to be complicated if we observe functions in that class behave in like extremely different ways on a finite set of points, okay? So like imagine you pick sort of D different inputs, right? So for us, this would be like D different, uh, sorry, 100 different inputs. So for us, it would be like 100 different instances of weighted independent set, okay? So for the pseudo dimension to, of a class of algorithms to be at least 100, um, with respect to this, you know, this choice of set, we'd have to see literally two to the 100 different function behaviors on this finite set, okay? So you need to have tremendous diversity in what the functions in your class do, even when you're just observing on a projection of a small finite set of all the possibilities, okay? So in particular, 
the only way you can have a pseudo dimension of at least D is if the number of functions in your class is at least two to the D. Because right? I'm telling you, I need two to the D sort of very different function behaviors. So you certainly need at least two to the D distinct functions to have any hope of that. So in particular for finite families, uh, the pseudo dimension is automatically finite and most log base two of the, of the set size. Um, but it's conceivable that you would have low pseudo dimension even if you had an infinite number of functions, if the functions just really don't behave very differently once you project them onto a finite set. Okay. So that's, that's, that's sort of my high level summary of what VC dimension and accordingly pseudo dimension measure. It. It's basically saying, do you get an exponential number of different fundamentally different function behaviors when you project onto a, onto a finite set or not? Okay. That's what it's measuring. Okay. So the first thing I said, the reason we care about pseudo dimension, literally the problem we care about reduces to the problem of computing the pseudo dimension. What do I mean formally? Okay, well, let's talk about the sample complexity. So the sample complexity is the smallest value of S such that we can achieve our goal, meaning that with high probability, our learning algorithm outputs something from capital C that's within epsilon of the best possible algorithm for cap from capital C for the unknown input distribution capital S. So the sample complexity S is literally governed by the pseudo dimension of the family of functions induced by our algorithm class. Okay, so specifically, if our algorithms induce a family of real valued functions that have pseudo dimension D, then the sample complexity for us up to log factors scales linearly with, with the pseudo dimension D, okay? and also with one over epsilon squared, where epsilon is the tolerance you're willing to accept from the optimal algorithm from capital C. Okay, so for example, if we were lucky enough to have an O of one pseudo dimension, constant pseudo dimension, then we would need only a constant number of represent representative instances, where the constant depends on the, on the error tolerance, a constant number of benchmark instances to make to give good algorithmic advice. If the, if the family of algorithms is a little bit more complicated in the sense of having a higher pseudo dimension, we'll need a correspondingly larger number of benchmark instances to give accurate algorithmic advice. So that's the main, and, and again, this is classic stuff, 20th century stuff. So this is well known. Pseudo dimension governs sample complexity. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, great. So what have I shown you? I've shown you basically a sufficient condition, basically a necessary condition also, right? So whether or not we have small sample complexity boils down to whether or not uh, the induced family of functions has small pseudo dimension. So do the algorithms that we care about actually induce families with small pseudo dimension, right? If not, all of this is totally uninteresting, okay? Now I'm sitting here giving you this talk and I really don't like wasting people's time. So presumably the answer is yes. Presumably the answer is that actually, yeah, uh, not just sort of finite classes, but actually interesting infinite classes of algorithms really do induce function families with small pseudo dimension. So that's what I want to sort of show you next through the specific example of the weighted independence heuristics we talked about previously. Okay. So let's go back to that example. So remember what it was, weighted independence set, uh, MBR problem. We're thinking about greedy heuristics and we're even thinking about like a super restricted family of greedy heuristics that do a single pass through the vertices not only that, they sort the vertices in a very particular way. Weight of a vertex over one plus degree of the vertex raised to some exponent, okay? The exponent at least zero, all right? Simple as this family is, you must concede it is an infinite family. And so it is not at all obvious that the pseudo dimension is finite, okay? So sort of the difference being that, you know, while, okay, it's an infinite family of functions, of algorithms and therefore functions. So you do have an infinite number of different function behaviors Pseudo dimension asks, do you have an exponential number of function behaviors even after projecting onto a finite sample? Okay? And that is not clear. Okay? It's clear that if the sample size goes to infinity, then presumably the number of different things that can happen go to infinity. But if I just sort of fix you know, 10 representative instances, can you actually get two to the 10 different function behaviors on those 10 instances? Okay? And in fact, you cannot, all right? So I'm gonna sketch a proof. So, on this slide and the next slide, I'll give a I'll give a short proof. And just to be clear, you know, some of you will be able to follow these proofs line by line. It's, it's it's not that difficult if you're sort of familiar with this stuff. But following it line by line is not the point. the The main takeaway I want you to have from this and the next slide is that okay, pseudo dimension may be a mouthful. You know, it's all seems sort of technical. But like that argument did not seem very hard. 
So I want you to have the impression that like, if you took the time to just sort of absorb the definitions, you yourself could prove theorems exactly like this without more, more tr much trouble. Okay? And that is in fact true, okay? All right, so let me walk you through this proof just to give you a flavor of, of sort of the counting arguments that, that show up, okay? So I'm using the word shatter here. It's the same uh, word that's used in DC dimension. Shatter just means like that is a subset of points where you literally see exponentially number, an exponential number of different uh, function behaviors, okay? And so proving that this, so we're gonna prove that the pseudo dimension for this family of algorithms is indeed finite. In fact, it's O of log N, where N here is the largest number of vertices that, that you're ever gonna have to deal with in one of the graphs in your input distribution, okay? <clears throat> so it's finite, you know, for some bound on the biggest graph you'll ever gonna see. So uh, to prove the pseudo dimension is O of log N, what we need to show is that for any finite subset, and again, for us, these are instances, so like weighted independent set instances, once you get to sufficiently large finite sets of instances, you do not see an exponential number of different, uh, of different function behaviors, okay? So that's what we're gonna show. Okay, we're gonna say, let's consider a set, suppose there's an exponential number of different function behaviors, we're gonna show that the set cannot be too big, okay? And that's sort of the mechanism by which you prove upper bounds in the pseudo dimension. So, fix your favorite subset. Okay, let's say it's 100 different instances of weighted independent set. Now, every, fit, every algorithm in this family is different, that every different choice of P can lead to different behavior. But now that we've fixed a finite set of only 100 instances of weighted independent set, there are some choices, some pairs of choices for that exponent P that are going to lead to identical behavior on all 100 instances. So call two choices of the exponent P and Q, think of them as maybe being very close to each other, call P and Q equivalent, if with respect to this finite sample, if on these 100 instances, uh, the algorithm executes identically on all 100, which really just means that they sort the vertices in the exact same order for each of these 100 instances, right? If the sorting order is the same, after that point, you don't worry about the exponent, you just sort of do your single pass and whatever happens, happens, okay? So equivalent means you get exactly the same ordering of the vertices in each of these 100 instances. What I claim and what I'll prove to you on the next slide is a lemma that says the number of equivalence classes does not grow that rapidly, okay? It grows polynomially in two parameters. First, the number of instances that we're looking at, S, so that's 100 for us, and then also polynomially with the number of vertices in the graphs. So maybe if there's a thousand graphs, then it would be a thousand, okay? So I'm gonna show you this, this is not obvious, but it's not hard to prove, we'll see that on the next slide. For now, I just want to observe that if we assume the lemma, we have completed the proof of the claim, okay? Why? Okay, so what does it mean to, to shatter a subset, shatter sort of uh, 100 weighted independent set instances? It means you get sort of an exponential number of fundamentally different function behaviors, okay? But, you know, obviously any two algorithms that are equivalent, right, or they use equivalent exponents, give exactly the same behavior on every one of the instances. So the number of distinct algorithm behaviors you will see on this finite subset is bounded above by the number of equivalence classes. But literally within an equivalence class, all those algorithms do literally exactly the same thing. So the only way you have hope of actually exhibiting two to the S different function behaviors is if S is really small, okay? And that's because the number of equivalence classes is growing only polynomially in S. Whereas you really, the, the requirement for shattering is growing exponentially in S. So this is, given the lemma, this is impossible unless S is just O of log N or, or, or smaller. All right, so why is it that if you look at sort of the number of different classes of exponents, uh, why is it so small? Why is it polynomial in the number of vertices and samples, okay? Well, I mean, one thing that's really nice about thinking about these greedy algorithms, it all boils down to how various comparisons get resolved, right? So all that matters is like, what is the sorted ordering of the vertices? And all that determines the sorted orders are just certain comparisons. So we have our 100 independent set instances. Each one has like a thousand vertices or whatever. So all that really matters is, you know, for a given instance, like instance number 17, say, and for a given pair of vertices in that instance, you know, maybe vertex seven, vertex 23, you know, we care about which way this comparison on the slide gets resolved, okay? The weight of the one vertex over one plus its degree raised to some exponent versus the analogous ratio for that other vertex X. Okay. In other words, if you told me the outcome of all comparisons of this form, 
that is all the information I need to know to reconstruct exactly what your algorithm did on all these instances. Like all that matters is the results of these comparisons. The comparisons resolve in exactly the same way for two different choices of the exponent. The algorithm is going to work in exactly the same way. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Focus on one of these comparisons. Okay. So again, instance number 17, vertices number 7 and 23. Think about the, this exponent, this parameter p. Start it at 0 and then increase it to infinity. Okay, let's think about what happens. When p equals 0, who's the winner of this comparison? Well, the denominator disappears, so it's just the vertex with the higher weight. The higher weight vertex wins the comparison when p equals 0. Now start taking p to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? Maybe, the, maybe this comparison never flips, but if the vertex with the higher weights also has the higher degree, then at some point, once you take p sufficiently large, the results of this comparison will flip to prefer the low degree vertex over the high weight vertex. And crucially, as you keep taking p larger and larger and larger, it never flips back, right? The low degree vertex will win forevermore from that point on. So as you vary p, the parameter, for this fixed comparison we're looking at, it flips only once, at most once, okay? Now think about the superposition of all of these comparisons. Again, we have sort of s choices for the instance. We have n choose two choices for the pair of vertices from that instance, so s times n squared, relevant comparisons. As we vary p from zero to infinity, each of those comparisons flips exactly once. So the number of changes in algorithm behavior we see over all infinitely many p's, it changes only n squared times s times. Okay? So that's why we only have a polynomial number of difference equivalence classes. And this is why the pseudo dimension is small. Well, in principle, we have an infinite number of algorithms. When we project down to a finite subset of instances, we really only see a polynomial number of different algorithm behaviors, not an exponential number of different algorithm behaviors. All right, um, so good. So that's for this particular example, weighted independent set. I, I hope from that argument, you get the feeling like this really did not seem to use much about the fact that it was the independent set problem, for example. It didn't seem to use much about a whole lot of things. And indeed, you know, in our original paper, you know, we have a lot of generalizations, so you can handle greedy algorithms quite generally. We also thought about local search algorithms and some other ones. Um, there's been, a, there's been a, a lot of really nice follow-up work along these lines. The State of the Art is an upcoming stock paper by Balkin, de Blasio, Dick, Kingston, Sandholm, and Bitterchik. Uh, and they really, so I'm not, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'll have to skip this, but they really very crisply, I mean, they, they really sort of pin down exactly what it is about the family of algorithms that is driving the argument I just showed you. Okay? And it's sort of very general. As a result, they get you know, polynomial sample complexity bounds for many, many, many different families of algorithms, okay? including Things as complicated as like parameterized semi-definite rounding. There's a lot of different classes that, that they can handle. Also really interesting applications in, in computational biology, where the parameters correspond to the weights before you run a dynamic programming algorithm to do, uh, to do uh, genome sequencing. All right, so um, let me just say two minutes about the online learning setup. And in the interest of time, you know, this will be for the people that know a little bit about online learning. Okay, I won't assume that much, but I'll assume you've seen the problem once in your life. If you haven't, you know, I'll get to the conclusions in just two minutes from now. Okay? Uh, so, Tim, sorry to pause you here. Like before yeah. we move on, there was a question in the chat. Uh, okay, good. So uh, do we care about the performance of the meta algorithm during the first S samples, or is it a, just about finding the best algorithm after S samples? So Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, that, that's, that's actually a very natural segue into here. So. The offline model is literally like a one-time decision, right? So, so my colleague comes to me with 12 TSP instances. I'm going to give him one algorithm back, and that's it. We'll never talk again. <laughs> now, the online setting is where you keep getting information in, in, in stages, and you want to keep making, you know, you want your decisions to improve as you get more and more information. So that's exactly what this model is going to, going to speak to. Yeah. Okay. And again, uh, I hope that answered your question, Omid. Uh, I don't know if there's a follow-up on that. Yeah, I guess we can move on. Okay. Um, so the usual online learning model, uh, so you have some time horizon capital T and it happens in stages. So, so think of it as capital T days. 
Um, you have to pick an action each day. For us, an action corresponds to an algorithm, like the choice of the exponent P, weighted independent set. And then an adversary, you can also pick a distribution over algorithms. And then an adversary, sort of knowing everything, okay, including the distribution that you chose, picks sort of the nastiest input that it can think of, like, like the nast nastiest instance of weighted independent set that it can think of, okay? And then, you know, basically, you know, you pick the distribution of algorithms, nature selects one algorithm, so like a random choice of the exponent P, for example, runs it on the adversary's input, and then you are rewarded or penalized according, according to how well your algorithm chosen did on the adversary's input. And the, the sort of, what you normally like to do in online learning is you like to have sort of vanishing regret guarantees. Okay, so you'd like to have an online algorithm, which, uh, you know, intelligently selects algorithms at each time step so that at the end of the day, you know, when you look back over your lifetime, you're like, you know, some days I made a bad decision, but if I average over all of the capital T days, I did basically as well as if I had upfront known the optimal fixed algorithm to use. Okay. So that's what, that's what it means to achieve vanishing regret. Okay. Over time, you do on average as well as the best fixed solution in hindsight. And this is a very well studied problem. I'm sure you've seen, I'm sure many of you have seen talks on this. There's off the shelf algorithms, which you think of as like solving this problem. Again, what's challenging for us is that we have an, I mean, so, so, if it was a finite family of algorithms, we could use an off-the-shelf algorithm like follow the perturbed leader or multiplicative weights. That would be fine for a finite family of algorithms. With an infinite family of algorithms, it's not even clear what it means to run these algorithms, okay? And um, people have definitely looked at online learning with sort of an infinite number of options, but generally there is some kind of Lipschitz uh, assumption. So, so generally you assume that, you know, if two actions are close to each other under some metric, then the cost you would incur will also be similar for each of those two actions. So nearby actions lead to sort of very similar kind of penalties and rewards. And here's actually a key, here's actually a key point. All right, so in learning theory, you know, we're used to thinking about half spaces, you know, neural networks with a fixed architecture, blah, 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 blah. Those are all the classical examples. And um, one thing common to all of the traditional applications in learning theory is you look at functions that have a Lipschitz property. If you move the input a little bit, the output only moves uh, a little bit as well. And one thing about algorithms is like they do not have this Lipschitz property at all. Like think about this weighted independent set example, right? So think about that exponent and think about moving that exponent by just a tiny bit from P to P plus epsilon. If it just so happens that one of your comparisons was right on the knife edge, a comparison might flip with an arbitrarily small perturbation of the exponent. So maybe all of a sudden you consider a different vertex first in your, in your order. And if you consider a different vertex first, the, the ultimate output of your greedy algorithm is gonna look totally different. So that's what was so frightening, I think, to sort of, you know, so I had to tell you like when I was, back when Rishi and I were working on this and I started telling my friends I was doing things like computing the VC dimension of greedy algorithms, everybody looked at me like I'd lost my mind. You can just tell that this, like the sentence didn't type check for people. Like, what are you doing using greedy algorithms VC dimension in the same sentence? And I think one of the things which is going on under that is you think about performance profiles for algorithms, they do not resemble in any way the notions of niceness of hypotheses that we're used to from learning theory. But so what this work is showing is that while you don't have the niceness like Lipschitz conditions, you have other nice structure that you're using greedy algorithms. It depends only on comparisons. And so that introduces a totally different type of nice structure into the families, that, into the functions that you're looking at. And so you get good sample complexity results, but you really get them for sort of fundamentally different reasons than why you were getting them in the traditional applications. Okay, so that, now that's to say that, so that's, that, that discussion is relevant for the offline stuff we talked about. It's also relevant for the online stuff. That's why we can't use off the shelf stuff to just get regret minimum, vanishing regret uh, immediately. Um, and in fact, we have an impossibility result even. We show it's, it's not just that, you know, it doesn't work off the shelf. It's actually impossible. So we show you actually cannot get a vanishing regret online algorithm, even for the very simple problem of choosing exponents for the greedy weighted independence set algorithm. And as you'd expect, this sort of crucially exploits the non lipschitz of the cost function, you know, with respect to the parameter uh, row, with respect to the exponent. The good news, you know, I want to leave you with some positive uh, results. So if you look at a smooth analysis variant, so here the adversary, instead of just picking its arbitrarily nasty weighted independent set instance, it picks its instance and then the vertex weights get perturbed slightly by nature. And so that's the smooth analysis aspect of it. In effect, what happens is that the little bit of randomness in the weights 
winds up basically providing the Lipschitz NIST type properties that we would want to use using sort of uh, off the shelf online learning algorithms when you have an infinite number of possibilities. Okay, so you can get vanishing regret in a smooth version uh, of this problem. Okay, so that was that's a, that's a pretty good consolation prize. Um, like I said, there's been a lot of recent progress over the last several years. Uh, I can't go through them all. Let me just sort of, for those of you that want to learn more, let me tell you the two sources I would go to first. One I already mentioned, Nina Balkin's chapter in the Beyond Risk Case Analysis book, chapter 29. That's out now. She put the chapter on archive. You can check it out. Um, and then Ellen Viterchik, who um, you know, is on that Stock 21 paper I mentioned, she's graduating this year. She's on the job market. You might want to keep an eye out for her. Um, and so in particular, when her PhD thesis is done, presumably this summer, uh, I'm quite sure that'll be a, another fantastic place to learn about all the latest and greatest, the latest and greatest stuff. Um, the open questions we've largely touched on. So uh, uh, someone asked about computational efficiency, mostly an open question. Um, I think there's also probably opportunities for any complexity theorists in the audience. I think at least for some of these learning problems, one should be able to show that under suitable average case hard assumptions, uh, you cannot do much better than exhaustive search. I think that would also be super interesting. Uh, the paper does talk about the gradient descent example and optimizing for the step size, but we view that as really just hopefully a baby step to a much more general theory of how, uh, how to do hyperparameter optimization. I think there's tons of opportunities to do just like much more interesting um, hyperparameter optimization analyses than we did in the paper. Uh, and I'll leave you with this idea that, you know, for those of us that do like to just design algorithms rather than do learning theory, um, you know, normally we design algorithms with an eye toward, you know, minimizing some kind of resource usage, you know, time, space, et cetera. And I want to point out that this, you know, the work I've talked about today actually offers an opportunity to design algorithms with a totally different metric in mind, right? So design not an algorithm, but really like a family of algorithms, for example, a parameterized algorithm. And maybe in addition to sort of the running time of any given, you know, member of that family, or in addition to its approximation ratio or whatever, Maybe you also actually want to think about the learnability of the best algorithm from your family with respect to an unknown input distribution. This is, I'd say, yet another metric that I think is really worth sort of thinking about as we sort of you know, brainstorm, you know, crazy new algorithms, you know, which might be sort of, uh, you know, which might be the, you know, the, the future state of the art. So these are all three, all three of these things. I can easily imagine great papers, PhD theses about, you know, maybe someone in the audience will, 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 uh, will. We'll, we'll do some work along those lines. That would be fantastic. So that's all for my time. Uh, thanks very much. Happy to stay on and take further questions. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we do have one question uh, in the chat. Uh, so how do you interpolate between two algorithms? Like, for instance, in the weighted independent set problem, you added the parameter p. The parameter p basically interpolates between different algorithms. So does this work if you have more than one parameter? Excellent question. Um, so the answer is yes, um, and the, the original paper with Rishi talks about this some. Um, I mean, basically, um, what, what, what sort of matters, right, so you might remember in that one part of the proof, we said, like, let's think about varying rho, how many times did the result of this comparison flip, and that's really what matters. Right, so more generally, so let me just talk about it specifically in the independence of context. You know, whatever, whatever sort of driving the algorithm performance, as you vary rho, you want it, it doesn't have to flip once, but it should flip like a polynomial number of times at most. And so, you know, basically if you have like bounded degree stuff, or if you have like a small number of parameters, you know, basically everything works out. It's kind of cool, actually. I mean, it's sort of, I mean, if you generalize it enough, it starts connecting to sort of things from, you know, algebraic topology and like kind of like, how many regions can you get if you sort of intersect sort of a bunch of different curves of a given degree? Um, so, so a bunch of that stuff you can you can do. And again, probably the, the ultimate version of this um, is the Stock 21 paper I mentioned by Balkan et al. Okay, but in particular, um, you know, other way, other natural ways of introducing a small number of parameters. You know, you might get a you might get a blow up in the sample complexity linear in the number of parameters, something like that. But um, but the results do extend. Good question. But there is no general way of relating to algorithm classes uh, in specific, is it? Like if you are looking at SAT solvers, like if I just pick two like very different class of algorithms for SAT solving, like is there a way to tell me like, uh, is there a way to relate these flips or something in this case? 
Yeah, I mean, so it's a good question. I mean, so so another thing that's nice about these sort of you know pseudo dimension sample complexity type results is you you have composition theorems. So if you have like you know two different sets, and in a way this is sort of obvious, right? So suppose you have two different families of algorithms, and you understand each individually, right? Now now consider like a fixed input distribution and some samples, right? You can separately learn the best one from this class, learn the best one from this class, and then just take the better of those two. Um, and, and in general, it's kind of like if you, if you have, you know, and, and in some ways that's really, I mean, the most general results along these lines sort of leverage this, that, you know, if, it, you know, if, uh, you know, the sort of composability, I'd say, of, of good sample, sample, of sample efficient families of algorithms. Yeah, I mean, and that's one thing that's funny is, I mean, the, the pseudo dimension is defined for every single family of algorithms, right? And so, like, if it's a finite family, it's small, and, and there's no, like, reason. It's just because there's not that many algorithms in the class. Um, and in some sense, like, right, so the pseudo dimension could be small for any number of reasons, <laughs> basically. And so, you know, when you're doing the theory, you're kind of just identifying sufficient conditions under which you can prove always the pseudo dimension is small. Um, and so that's that's sort of the, the the right way to interpret the results I've been discussing here. I have a quick question. Like, what happens if you select these samples uh, adaptively, like in active learning fashion? Uh, does that uh, improve anything? Yeah. So I mean, in some ways, like the online learning version of the problem does allow that. Um, you could imagine trying to have some hybrid version. Uh, I'd have to think about that. Um, but there's no que like like there's no question that you know like in the impossibility result I mentioned, saying that without a smooth analysis you can't get regret minimization, that's like heavily exploiting. Uh, is that true? I have to think about that actually. Uh, in any case, the positive results certainly allow for an adaptive adversary. So for the positive results, you could you could accommodate that. Um, Yeah, I guess that, I mean, I feel like there should be some uh, middle point in between the two where uh, your question would also make sense, but I'll have to think about it offline. But it is very natural, yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah. 